about speaking last at one of these is I can point to three other people and just say, well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, the downside, however, is that uh, I've been scratching out about 80% uh, of what I've written here, so um, this will be actually a lot of reading between the lines. Um, so a couple thoughts on my reactions to the work and trying to put those reactions into some sort of historical perspective. So I read this book um, in some ways like Laurie explained as this ethnographic or anthropological tale. But I also read this book at a few different historical levels. So one of them was seeing this book as one that's about the history of the concept of human subjects and the evolving laws that we have in this country to deal with that. So for example, there were laws put into place after the Nuremberg trials and the various wartime atrocities that came to light after World War II laws that went into place in 1946, and um, some of those were effective and some weren't. We then can follow this through to the end of the 1970s, for example, when there was something released called the Belmont Report, which specified three different um, uh, criteria that research involving human subjects had to, uh, had to meet. One of them involved respect, and this was simply respect uh, for people and for the human subject itself. Another was beneficence. Was the research that was being done being conducted for the good of society? And the third category is one of justice. <coughs> was the research that was being done, the benefits that were going to come out of this or imagined to come out of this, were these going to be equally distributed? So that's one way we can think about this. We can also put the story that Sklut tells here when it starts in the um, early 1950s, and we can frame that in terms of what was happening both in medical research at the time as well as what was happening in fields like molecular biology. When the cells were first taken from Henrietta Lacks in the early 1950s, recall this was before Crick and Watson had even deciphered the basic structure of DNA. So this is, you know, in some ways almost in the prehistory era of molecular biology, if we want to think of it that way. We can also frame it in the, the um, context of the polio scares that were happening at the time in the 1950s when tens of thousands of American children and adults were coming down with viral uh, contracted polio. And there was a huge pressure from the federal government and various research agencies to conduct polio research and to come up with a vaccine for polio. So that's one way that we can think of this. We can also think of the story as a history of intellectual property. In this case, the intellectual property isn't a particular idea, per se, but rather it's a question of who actually owns the material culture that is being used in this research. And I use the word culture there in both senses of the word. One of the topics that Sklut gets to in the book, although it gets a little bit lost, is the story of John Moore, a uh, oil pipeline worker who had his spleen removed in the 1970s by doctors at UCLA Medical Center. Moore eventually realized that the cells that were taken from his uh, spleen had then been developed into cell lines, um, which according to Sklut were estimated to be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 billion. Moore um, sues the University of California um, after numerous twists and turns through the legal system. His lawsuit is finally thrown out, and it's basically ruled that he doesn't own the tissues that were, or the intellectual property that was uh, derived from the tissues that were removed from uh, this person's body. So I, that was one of the ways in which I read this story, was our evolving notions of what IP is. You know, who owns what, who gets the benefits from it, who makes the money from it. Another way we can look at this story is one of a um, history of laboratory practice. Um, how is research done in laboratories? How are research materials circulated among laboratories? Um, one of the historians that I like, a man by the name of uh, Robert Kohler, who's at uh, University of Pennsylvania, wrote an interesting book uh, several years ago called Lords of the Fly. And what he does is he looks at the research that was being done in the early part of the 20th century on fruit flies, or Drosophila, and he looks at how these genetically modified fruit flies were traded almost as gift items in the way that an anthropologist would understand as they <coughs> circulate among various tribes as gifts between various laboratories. And these gifts that uh, these fruit flies, these particular genetic lines of fruit flies represented, 
came with a whole set of mutual obligations and expectations, what he calls in his book a moral economy of science. You know, these laws and expectations aren't set out, but they're ones that anyone who's participating in this research understands. And moral economy, I mean, the term goes back um, to research that was done a long time ago, looking at bread riots um, in 18th century England. But basically, what are the unstated expectations and assumptions about how resources are shared <coughs> among people? Um, oftentimes, these rules are not set down in writing, but it's commonly understood between the various people that there's a certain quid pro quo or certain rules of behavior and expectations that govern that. Another way we can think about this, maybe in the broadest sense, is what does this book say about the way in which science was done and the way in which it's done now? What is science? You know, that's a pretty fundamental question that we can ask. Is it simply the production of knowledge? Is it the creation of intellectual property? Is it the creation of commercial products? Do the ends in science justify the means? There's a long history of what we can call forbidden science, whether we want to think of it as Galileo's encounters with the Catholic Church, or efforts in the 1930s by physicists to self-censor the research that they were doing on uranium fission, research that was done in the 1970s to limit um, or set criteria <laughs> standards for work that was being done in recombinant DNA, or calls in recent history for moratoria on research involving um, various aspects of nanotechnology. So I think Sklut's book opens up questions about this nature of both forbidden science as well as forbidding science. And finally, I think her book, um, besides giving an interesting window into the history of the biotech industry, I think, as Laurie pointed out, it sets out some disparities in scientific knowledge between Henrietta Lacks's family and the medical establishment. When Deborah Lacks wants to find out some basic biology about what's happening with the various uh, cells, what is done. She's basically given a textbook and told to go read about it on herself. Um, we also see questions about differential access to knowledge as well as health care. One could make the argument that the Lax family certainly didn't have the same sort of access to health care and the medical benefits that was coming from research as some of the people who were conducting the research or who benefited from it. And finally, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this later, but a question for you all is maybe as we're talking this afternoon, I'd be curious to hear what you think is noteworthy about the book. What did you like about it and what didn't you like about it? And I have my own thoughts on that. And I'll give a little tip of the hand there by saying what I found interesting in reading this book is at least for historians of science or historians of biology, the story that's in this book is extremely well known. Um, it's nothing new. And I think Sklut acknowledges that by talking about all the various ways in which it's been written about from writers at Jet and Ebony Magazine, to Rolling Stone, to other people that she credits in her notes, but oftentimes doesn't refer to in the text itself. So I'm sort of curious to get some thoughts from you all on what you might think is new or noteworthy about it. Thanks.